So today we begin our second series of uh, Bible heroes. Now we focus on the New Testament heroes. Um, by right, uh, I should begin with uh, John the Baptist because uh, he is the midpoint uh, passing as the last of the Old Testament prophets and then introducing Jesus, uh, the beginning of the New Testament. Uh, but because Joseph is so important, and when we speak of New Testament, uh, immediately he comes to my mind. Uh, so in the publicity material, I decided to uh, introduce Joseph first. Anyway, uh, next week we will uh, go back to John the Baptist. Joseph has many titles. Uh, Joseph of Nazareth, his hometown. Joseph, the spouse of Mary, his relationship with the Virgin Mary. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, uh, his relationship with the earthly Jesus. And then Joseph, the worker, his occupation. Matthew chapter 1 verse 19 mentions that he is a just man. Uh, in another translation, he is a man of honor. We know that uh, he is the husband of Mary and the adopted father of Jesus of Nazareth. He does not physically beget Jesus, but that uh, Mary has conceived Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And together we honor them as the Holy family. At home, uh, if you have an altar and you wonder what statues uh, to place, obviously uh, the first one you should have would be the crucifix. And then if you are hesitating about what to choose, then I would suggest that you put uh, the statue of the Holy Family. Uh, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, protectors uh, of our families. Joseph takes an active role uh, in the Gospel of Matthew and also the Gospel of Luke. He is not mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, in John, his name is used only as the surname of Jesus. When in John 6, 42, there was a remark, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? So the information about Joseph uh, can be found primarily in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. Mary was betrothed to Jesus, but uh, before he brought her in to his home, Mary was found to have conceived a child. And uh, Joseph agonized over that apparent illegitimate pregnancy. But he protects her and the unborn Jesus by accepting her as his wife after the nurse appears to him in a dream and directs him to do so. There is, in recent years, a uh, sculpture of the sleeping Joseph or we call the dreaming Joseph referring to this uh, incident. Uh, it is an, an attempt to express uh, Joseph agonizing over that experience but at the same time also an expression of his surrendering to God he, he, he knew about that fact, but he did not, could not make sense of it. And then the best way is just to surrender, to just go and sleep to rest. And in that manner, God revealed his plan to Joseph. Eventually, Joseph accepts and marries her, but has no sexual relationship with her until... Uh, after she gave birth.
uh, third here my expressions may, may, may be uh, not very clear uh, what I want to express actually is that there's no sexual relationship at all uh, And then he gives the child the name uh, Yezu, Jesus, meaning uh, the Lord saves. We have two accounts of the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and in Luke. In the case of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew begins his Gospel with uh, that genealogy of Jesus, and starting with Abraham and then tracing Jesus' lineage to King David down to the generations until Joseph. And that concluding verse, Martin, the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of her was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. This genealogy of Jesus uh, in Matthew is very interesting uh, because it contains uh, the names of four women. Uh, but today uh, we are not uh, giving introduction to the Gospel of Matthew, we will not uh, enter into that detail. But just to remark here that there is this very interesting uh, details about the genealogy of Jesus, uh, which you may want to uh, research. As for the Gospel of Luke, he gives uh, additional details of Joseph's life and his relation to Jesus. And Luke's account of the genealogy begins in chapter 3 and is written in such a way that it traces back all the way back to Adam. But if you compare the two accounts, you realize that uh, uh, there are details that are not compatible with uh, each other and they cannot be reconciled also, in spite of the various attempts to reconcile uh, these differences in details. So I would like to make a comment here, just that the, the two genealogies are meant to present theological points about Jesus and God's plan of salvation in the history uh, of Israel, rather than presenting uh, historical factual data about his uh, ancestors. Luke describes uh, how Jesus' birth came to happen at Bethlehem. And uh, accordingly, Joseph goes there to comply with a census ordered uh, by uh, Caesar Augustus. And they go to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is the client's place of origin following the lineage of uh, David. There Jesus is born in a manger, since there is no room at the ink. And then we have the accounts of the visits uh, by shepherds and the angels uh, sing the glory of God. In this account here, uh, the threatening figure of Herod does not loom over the sin in the Gospel of Luke. You find that only in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, here the emphasis is on the rejoicing of the angels and the shepherds. And they came to uh, honour the infant Lord. In Matthew, we have uh, the account of a wise man from the east they come to Jerusalem after the birth of Jesus. They were supposed to be uh, scholars who uh, st study astrology. And, and, and then they come all the way to Jerusalem. They look for King Herod and inquired about the birth of this uh, very special person. And eventually, uh, the star lead them to uh, the manger in Bethlehem. They go into the house, they see the child, the mother, Mary, and falling to their knees, uh, they do him homage and offer him gifts of gold, frankincense, and more. I think the stories of uh, the infant Jesus, we are all quite familiar with. Um, 
because of the importance of Christmas to us. In Luke's account, uh, Joseph travels to Bethlehem for a census and then returns to Nazareth without going to Egypt. It is uh, in the Gospel of Matthew that that is this threat of uh, King Herod and then Joseph leads Mary and Jesus in their flight to Egypt to avoid the wrath of Herod the king. And after his death, only they, uh, they returned to Nazareth and settled there. So to know the background of the birth of Jesus and the role of uh, Joseph in this whole experience, you have to cross-reference the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Joseph is reported by Luke uh, to bring the 12 years old Jesus to Jerusalem. According to the Jewish custom, a uh, uh, male boy will be initiated as adult at the age of 12. That means from 12 years onward, they have to keep uh, the Mosaic laws and observe them. Uh, all the requirements. In that particular trip, Jesus is lost uh, when Mary and Joseph were on their way back. Only three days later, uh, they returned to the temple and eventually uh, realized that Jesus is still there. And then there's this uh, remark by Jesus to his parents. Did you not know that I must be busy with my father's affair? That is the first time that his identity, not just as the son of man, but as the son of God, is revealed through the Gospel of Luke. But Joseph and Mary at that time, um, they are not able to fully comprehend that message yet. Is slowly and gradually by being with Jesus that they fully understand who Jesus is and their role in accompanying him in the message of salvation. After presenting Jesus publicly in the temple of Jerusalem, little else is mentioned about Joseph except that the there is this mention about he being the carpenter. Uh, when people remark about uh, Jesus, say that he is the son of a carpenter. And his death is not recorded in the Bible. Uh, it seems that he had already died uh, by the time Jesus started his public ministry. There is an interesting question because uh, in the Gospels, The names James, Joseph, Judah, Simon, these names are mentioned as the brothers of Jesus. And also mentioning of his sisters, but unnamed. So an Eastern Orthodox tradition explained that Joseph was a widower and that these brothers and sisters were from his first marriage, thus making them his third brothers and stepsisters. But the more Catholic tradition maintains that the Joseph and Mary uh, never engaged in conjugal relationship or had other children together. And whether Joseph had a first marriage before or not, not mentioned in the Catholic traditions. So more often, the brothers of Jesus in the Catholic traditions are said to be the cousins of Jesus. That uh, in the Jewish societies, uh, whether you are cousins or blood brothers, you are all called brothers in, within the family. And the Catholic tradition maintains that uh, these so-called brothers of Jesus are actually uh, his cousins. There are some uh, non-gospel uh, additional informations with regard to the family of Jesus and about Joseph. So there are certain uh, icons 
of the nativity scene, uh, showing Joseph tempted by the devil to break off his betrothal uh, with Mary, and how he resisted that uh, temptation. It is not a gospel account, so it is that's part of the legend concerning Joseph. Some other uh, images of Joseph depict uh, his staff as topped with flowers and usually lilies. Uh, possibly based on the non-canonical account in the proto evangelion of James of how Mary's spouse was chosen. There is this uh, more uh, detailed description about the agony of uh, Joseph. He struck his face and threw himself on the ground in sackcloth and wept bitterly. Who has set this trap for me? Who stole the virgin from me and defiled her? Has not the story of Adam been repeated with me? For while Adam was glorifying God, the serpent came and found Eve alone, deceived her and defiled her. So it has also happened to me. So this account goes on to say that Joseph himself was accused of illicit sex with Mary and was banished for the period in the desert. Uh, but of course, all these are extra uh, biblical accounts that uh, not surprising in, in the uh, early church, not only about Joseph, uh, there, even about maybe about Jesus himself. And there were these extra biblical stories that uh, people try to uh, comprehend. And so they try to make sense of some of the events and happenings in the life of the Holy Family. And they came up with all these different stories, not uh, historically uh, evidence. Then there are some uh, pictures of uh, Joseph and that shows uh, the young Jesus walking along with uh, Joseph the carpenter. Joseph is much praised for responding to the angel's message and protecting Mary when some of those in Nazareth would have stoned her as an adulteress. So surrounding the life of Joseph, of course, there are there are a lot of speculations, a lot of uh, wondering and so forth. But the message that we have in the gospel is very clear that Joseph uh, knew something about the pregnancy of Mary. He could not understand. But being a just man, uh, being a man of honor, he decided not to put her to shame, you know, but wanting to just dismiss her quietly until he received the revelation from God that Mary has conceived Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. In our Catholic tradition, we have great devotion to Joseph. It is uh, honored as a patron against doubt and hesitation, as well as a patron saint of workers and of a happy death. He is uh, considered the model of a pious believer who received grace at the moment of death. So uh, very often, uh, people at the point of uh, dying would turn to St. Joseph for intercessions. In fact, we realize that there are many uh, associations that has a work of mercy to the bereaved family uh, has St. Joseph as the patron saint. Most famous one in Singapore would be the St. Joseph Dying Aid Association in Hokkan. Catholics also believe that Joseph prays uh, especially for families, fathers, and expectant mothers, travelers. All these are linked to his life, no? Travelers because of that flight to Egypt, immigrants, craftsmen, engineers, and working people in general. So he's patron saints of uh, almost uh, all the workers, regardless of their occupations. The principal feast day of St. Joseph is on 19th of March. Uh, St. Joseph, the husband of Mary, 
and there's a secondary feast of uh, St. Joseph, which is uh, 1st of May, and the feast of St. Joseph the Worker. Usually uh, in a diocese, uh, it's got a special uh, a church that is dedicated to St. Joseph, then they have an option to choose whether 19th of March or 1st of May as the uh, feast day of the parish. In Singapore, uh, St. Joseph Bukitima has traditionally chosen 1st of May as their day uh, for celebrations. I think partly because uh, that is being a public holiday, so there will be more time, etc., for the parish and the parishioners to celebrate the feast. And also, I think in the past, many Malaysians would travel all the way uh, from different states down to Singapore uh, to participate in the feast day celebration. What can we learn from the life of uh, St. Joseph? Number one, the sanctity of human works. Uh, Joseph, a craftsman, making his living uh, from his hands with the skills of a carpenter. He provided for and supported the whole family. All of us are called to work also, not just as a way of to earn our living, but as a way to participate in God's creation. The book of Genesis says from the very beginning when God created the universe, God has entrusted to man uh, that privilege to be his stewards, to look after his creation. So the ability to work for us is a way to express our human dignity and a way to express our praise and worship of God. The journal of the worker reminds us of the holiness we can bring to our work and the human dignity we must protect and honour for workers everywhere. Of course, here the, work, uh, the word workers is used uh, in the traditional context more to, to the blue-collar workers. Um, but I think this word today can be applied to even white-collar workers. By the way, uh, in the church, there is a community known as uh, Opus Dei. Uh, the, the, that's in Latin, and the word means the work of God, uh, which actually takes on this spirituality that uh, every man should sanctify his daily work the sanctification of our ordinary day-to-day -day work, including our occupations, uh, is the way to glorify God. Number two, spousal fidelity and trust. Joseph accepted a wife that society would have him rejected and a child that was not his biological son. He was humble enough to accept and obey the will of God. He did it with unusual inner strength. The Bible said that he was a just man, a man of honor. Though Joseph is not disputed as uh, speaking much, but his actions speak louder than words. His silent toy and care for the child and uh, his wife speak volumes of the dedication and commitment he had for the family. So we honor St. Joseph also as the patron saint of the family. And of course, together, uh, the Mary, Joseph and Jesus, they are honored as the Holy Family. Joseph stayed faithful to Mary and protected her and the child Jesus. He is uh, considered patron saint for all husbands and uh, their families. He continues to inspire every father to care for his family with sensitive understanding and courageous love, but suddenly without being vociferous about it. So uh, those of you who are fathers here, uh, it is good um, that you develop a special devotion to St. Joseph and uh, constantly pray to him for intercessions to guide and lead you uh, to exercise your very important role as the head of the family, um, 
a father to your children and a faithful husband to your wife. Number three, care for the migrants and itinerary people. Escaping from the persecution of Herod, Joseph flight with Mary and Joseph and moved to Egypt for a while. And today we know that uh, all over the world, uh, migrant workers and itinerary people uh, face various kinds of difficulties and challenges. And uh, they suffer the great youth because they are away from their families and their loved ones. In our society, we, we have many of these uh, foreign workers, migrants, itinerary people, which uh, we as Christians have the responsibility to uh, really uh, care for them and uh, serve them to, to the best of our ability. Thus, uh, remember that our forefathers, uh, they were migrants also uh, to this land. In the Diocese of Singapore, we have a commission that especially look after the migrants and itinerary people. They look into the various aspects of the welfare of these people. And I think in individual parishes like ours, uh, before the COVID-19, uh, we have a group that uh, organize get together for the migrants used to be uh, once at least once a month uh, on a Saturday evening we give them free meals and then organize some activities for them trying to show our care and concern for them in, in small ways uh, but I think more can be done on our part to express our solidarity uh, with the migrant workers and itinerary people so the Archdiocese Commission is known as ACME, Archdiocese Commission for Migrants and Itinerary People. Uh, and it looks after the pastoral needs of the migrants in Singapore uh, with casework, breakfast events, workers' dormitories, befriended networks, etc. etc. And also uh, a lot of emphasis on skills development uh, for them. The Franciscan Sisters place at Holland Road uh, has traditionally in Singapore been one of the venues where uh, some of these uh, courses and programs are being organized for the migrant workers. Now some of the events are being held at uh, Agape Village Topayo, especially the training sessions. Okay, these are some of the questions that you can think about. Um, how do you appreciate the work that you yourself do as a worker? How does St. Joseph inspire you in your daily work? Number two, what grace would you ask St. Joseph to intercede for you for your family? And what can you learn from St. Joseph in your care for the family? So these questions are meant for both personal reflections